welcome to another episode of the Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Juma Iraqi. Before I introduce today's guest, I just want to mention that this podcast is available on YouTube in video format, but you can also listen to it on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud as well. So today I've brought back a very special guest. I've been getting a lot of requests to get this man back on the podcast. So thank you, Broderick Chavez, for coming back on the show. It's a pleasure to have you back on. And uh, how is everything on your end today? Um, everything's good. I appreciate uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come back. And uh, as as silly as it sounds, it's it's nice to be loved. So I'm I'm glad that your listeners uh, had some interest in having me back. Perfect. Yeah, we have a lot of things that we want to discuss today, and I can't think of a better man to mm. to get on the show to, to discuss these things. So today's topic is. Uh, is hormones. Uh, but before we dive into the questions, for people that might not know who Broderick Chavez is, could you give us a brief introduction about yourself? Oh, I'm really so terrible at that sort of thing. As our off-air conversation alluded to, I'm pretty crap at that sort of thing. Um, my name is Broderick Chavez. I am uh, approaching 47 years old. I have been involved in the performance side and athletic side of strength and bodybuilding since Literally, um, wow, I started training at age 10. I was already competitive by my early teens. So my competitive career goes back to the early 80s and um, picked up along the way a degree in biology. I have worked uh, for some major uh, supplement companies. I have uh, worked on the periphery of some pharmaceutical companies, all the while coaching athletes, developing my skills as a coach, interacting with some of the top uh top minds in the sport, which I continue to do to this day. And, you know, I, it's silly to go down a, a ledger sheet of, you know, people I've coached and things I've done, but I've been very involved in uh, high, high level performance athletics, sports ranging from bodybuilding and powerlifting to the uh, obscure. I've worked with bobsledders. I've worked with track and field athletes. I've worked recently with a lot of MMA a number of MMA and boxing athletes. So uh, across the width and birth of sports performance and just generally any opportunity I get to make people a little bigger, stronger, or faster, I'm in. Perfect. Wow, that's impressive. I know you've worked <laughs> with a lot of uh, people, but uh, I've even heard that you worked with uh, bodybuilders on like the elite level, like Olympia level. Yes, I have. I have. I wouldn't. I don't like the word coached. I have consulted with and done some problem solving for competitors that have walked on the Olympia stage, both male and female. Awesome. Yeah, I, I know that you don't like to be preferred as a coach because you're not the coach type of uh, guy. No, I, I'm not. I don't have the right psyche for that. I'm not holding anyone's hand. I'm not helping anyone pee. I just, you know, give me a problem. I'll solve it. I'll get to the root of your issue. But uh, you don't look for a lot of touchy feely human interaction because I'm just not that guy. No humor, no temperament for that. <laughs> That's fine. That's uh, <laughs> at least you're honest about it. So. All right, Frederick. So let's uh, let's dive into the questions and to get things uh, started. Um, what are the functions of testosterone and estrogen in relation to strength and muscle hypertrophy? Um, sure, I, I, that's a that's really that's my bread and butter. That's where I live. But what I find valuable is before we tackle that, let's just step back momentarily and briefly talk about what their role developmentally. And that will then elucidate a lot of everything that comes after it. Um, something that most people fail to remember from you know, junior high school or high school biology is every single person walking this planet started embryonically, mind you, as a female. Okay, every, the, the template for human beings is female. And then at a certain point in development, a gene clicks on, which you know instigates that whole XY thing. Not important you really dwell on it, but understand that Female, 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 then there either is or is not a trigger that instigates maleness. So we all have the same basic template. That's important. So now you get to, you know, you, you've got this living creature. You get to just pre, just peripubescence. That's when another set of genes clicks on and starts to instigate the manufacture of sex hormones. And that's why I brought us to this point of the conversation, is the original job of these hormones 
and really it's testosterone more so even than estrogen, both in males and females, is it is a developmental hormone. It instigates changes from immaturity to maturity, changes in muscle mass, changes in sex organs, changes in bone length and the closure of bone platelets so that it not only determines it instigates bone growth, but then it also ceases bone growth. And it's why pubescent problems can lead to your bone irregularities since the problems all must originate there. So the real role of these sex hormones initially is developmental changes taking you from a basically blank androgynous template that is a 10-year-old child to an adult which is eh, 20-ish years old, fully male or female. So that's the key goal. Now, the reason I point that out is think how much that is. Think about the magnitude of that change. In your mind, picture a 10-year-old child and then picture a 20-year-old adult. Almost unrecognizably different. So that's the power these compounds have. Now, in a child, there's, let's call it a lot of room for growth. You know, size, you know, mass triples from 10 years old to adulthood, you know, you're talking about changes in morphology, facial features, you know, facial hair, you know, you changes morphology and sex organs. There's a lot of room to grow. Once all of that is done, the role of sex hormones becomes much narrower. It's now simply the maintenance of muscle mass and the maintenance of reproduction. That's essentially all sex hormones do. So it's it's clear that you know, you, you get a, you know, say you in, introduce, let's just make up a number, 100 milligrams of testosterone is capable of changing a child into an adult. Now at an adult, 100 milligrams is a lot because you have a lot less to do with it. Mm-hmm. So it's important to kind of understand that, you know, the values of, you know, everyone always kind of wants to reminisce and how great everything was hormonally at pubescence. That's for a reason. because you're literally changing the kind of creature you are. Now, once you reach pubescence, a lot less testosterone and or estrogen, and we'll talk about how kind of one leads to the other, but it, it, it becomes pretty apparent that a lot less is needed, or if you have the same amount, it needs to go to other means, and those means are exercise, activity, you know, maintenance of muscle mass, etc., so in a, in a kind of a big picture kind of thing, that's the role of testosterone in males. And then in females, there's still a manufacture of testosterone. Simultaneously, there's a manufacture of estrogen. Estrogen is the major uh, determinant of sexual morphology and changes both physical and cognitive in women. In men, because we are, by the way, remember – always refer back to we're actually women at heart or a gene anyway um men manufacture testosterone and then the testosterone because it is a larger slightly more complex molecule is then cleaved into a sub hormone estrogen so we are our series of events starts at testosterone and diminishes to estrogen dht and some other things where women produce a small amount of testosterone and a much larger amount they actually manufacture estrogen in its raw form at an ovarian level but they also adrenally and partially ovarian produce testosterone which also gets reduced into estrogens secondarily interesting and it's funny because like if you look at the chemical structure of testosterone and estrogen it's not a whole lot of difference there but no there is not again there's a lot of difference on what type of effect it has on the body well again that's something that crops up i realize it's not really your audience but it's something that crops up in you know my world and my field is if you look at every anabolic steroid ever made if you draw them out you actually draw the diagram i mean you really need a refined trained eye to see the difference i mean sometimes it's just one little dash one little h it's the tiniest little changes but that tiny little change can be the difference between a female growing a mustache or growing a bicep it's really very very little changes have enormous order of magnitude changes on the effect of certain compounds so at at any point you'll know, keep that in mind it's it's the nuance at this level it's the nuances that matter for sure so um and just kind of a a side thought something i I used is i have this 
either gift or, or curse of speaking by way of analogy. And I stumbled on this the other day that got the point across. And I think your listeners probably savvy enough to have gotten the point. But the analogy I made uh, was speaking to a group of people that really had no understanding of chemistry is um, think of this whole process much like petroleum. When you dig a hole in the ground and pull out petroleum, it is this very large crude, as in crude oil, crude molecule. But the beauty of it is it's its size. There's so many things we can cleave out of it. We can get gasoline, we can get kerosene, we can get solvents, we can get all this stuff out of it because it's so large and, and well-formed. That's what we have here with testosterone. Testosterone is so large and complex. And even if you went above that, pregnenolone, and if you even went above that, cholesterol is such an enormous molecule, it's very easy to derive subhormones from it because making something smaller is much easier than manufacturing something bigger from a biological energy kind of perspective. So that's the, that's the kind of series of events is testosterone is the kind of the master sex hormone, and then all these other ones are derived from it, if that helps. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so now now you're kind of at the point like we're past you know pubescence, we're into adulthood. Now we still have this stuff floating around. Um, interestingly, everyone wants to separate them and say, oh well, estrogen's girly and testosterone's manly, and that's how we're going to leave it. And that's absolutely the dumbest thing. I mean, I don't mean to be condescending, but that that's really silly. Um, there's so many roles that each plays in the other. Interestingly, right out of the gate, um, it's completely polar opposite of what you would think on one level. Um, the male libido is driven by estrogen, and the female libido is driven by testosterone, which is completely you know, not what people would immediately assume. It doesn't have any practical value. Like, you can't really use that information to, you know, you know, get a little extra on the weekend or anything, but it's still interesting to know that right out of the gate, most of your perceptions are fucking wrong. <laughs> so, um, and also, you know, people ha kind of have this attitude that building muscle is the sole domain of testosterone, and, you know, growing titties and crying over chocolate bars is solely the domain of estrogen. And once again, that's not even remotely accurate. Um, estrogen, first of all, women have a wonderful capability of building muscle, and they're very non-testosterone dominant. So obviously testosterone is not the sole purveyor of muscle growth. There are plenty of, even even in the world I don't live in, which is the natural world, um, you know, even in that natural world, there are some very muscular, capable athletic females. They exist. They're real things. And most of them have relatively normal bell curve female testosterone values. So, you know, right out of the gate, you can, without knowing any real science or anything, you're just your powers of observation should lead you to the assumption that testosterone is not the sole purveyor of muscle growth. Then moving over to men, people kind of have this attitude that, you know, estrogen's bad, estrogen will make you girly, it'll make you whatever. And, you know, I've even heard people go so far as to, it'll make you gay. Like, I, like, like that's a thing. Like, I, it's just insanity. Estrogen is valuable in muscle growth even in men on so many levels. I'll touch on a couple, but before I even touch on that, consider this. Women, historically, have much lower incidence of cardiovascular disease, much lower heart attack rate. Part of it is because, as a whole, they have lower body weights, for sure. Women are smaller. Smaller people tend to be on the lower side of heart attacks. But secondarily, women have more estrogen. Estrogen is very, very preservative of a positive LDL-HDL ratio, of a total suppressed cholesterol values, and vascular pliability, the actual health and contractile abilities of vascular tissue. Women get all this wonderful estrogen. Their cardiovascular systems survive longer. And coincidentally, to illustrate that point, women that reach menopause, their incidence of heart attack goes up radically because their insulin or their insulin, their estrogen values go down. There's a distinct line in the sand when women begin to lose their estrogen, they begin to gain the potential for male like cardiovascular incidents. Move that over again, we're the same creature, men and women, move that concept over to men, you can pretty quickly see, hey, estrogen's probably preservative of the cardiovascular system. 
And lo and behold, there's tons of studies out there. Feel free to look them up. I won't quote them. But the higher in general, the higher the estrogen value in men, the lower their long-term chances of myocardial infarction, the lower chances of heart attack with elevated estrogen. Now, Estrogen can elevate to a a point where it does bring on all sorts of other problems. You can get behavioral problems. You can get breast tissue development. You can get a lot of issues that are negative. But, you know, specifically, estrogen is very preservative of the cardiovascular system. Secondarily, it has some very strong effects on the inflammatory slash anti-inflammatory action of other hormones. And therefore, estrogen is very preservative of the joints. In general, you find people with low estrogen values tend to be at the forefront of orthopedic issues. Lastly, and this one's a little harder to quantify, but it's a real thing, but I won't beat it to death because I don't have a lot of solid data right on the tip of my tongue. Estrogen is deeply involved in the liver's ability to convert somatropic hormone, growth hormone, into resultant growth factors, IGF-1, MGF, all the stuff you hear about. And diminished estrogen values radically diminish the efficacy of your growth hormone, whether it's homemade or store-bought. Estrogen is vital in the conversion of growth hormone to the resulting growth factors. Uh, there's actually kind of a mythos among you know, drug-using bodybuilders that you need to take a gram of testosterone while using growth hormone. And in a silly, roundabout way, that's actually right because – taking a grant of of testosterone will absolutely result in elevated estrogen levels. Elevated estrogen levels will absolutely improve the efficacy of your growth hormone. Now, there's certainly better ways to go about that since that crude methodology, but it does illustrate the point, a number of points. One, the value of estrogen, and two, it actually illustrates something that I almost hate to say out loud is a lot of the bro science bullshit is actually rooted in some reality. The problem is they're not bright enough or organized enough to actually figure out what part's real and what part's not. But, you know, like all kind of wives' tales and and family myths, there is a lot of root truth there it's just getting to the actual application part that's kind of not their forte but but anyway i i digress i apologize <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i think it's great that you brought that up because i recently had a discussion with a friend because he had heard not related to this he had heard that phil heat eats more white fish uh, at the later stage of his pre pre-contest diet and because he thinks that it thins the skin. And I basically explained this to my friend that... It's a lower pro- fat food choice. Exactly. So it's basically just a caloric adjustment. You're basically just lowering your calorie, but a lot of these bodybuilders, they don't really understand this. They just understand that when I go from eating red meat to eat fish, I seem to lean out more. So maybe the fish is thinning my skin but it's not the adjustment in calories like it actually is and then the funny part and not to interrupt you per se but the funny part there is now try to explain to them that's actually because of a reduction in dietary fat and they'll lose their fucking mind and you oh no fat's wonderful and fat but meanwhile taking fat out of the diet and therefore transposing a high fat protein source to a low fat protein source their physique gets better but tell them it's because of fat restriction they'll lose their fucking mind so you know i i, I try to just keep my mouth shut and go oh yeah fish skin thin skin yeah you know i'll even to take it further and even be even more child like you know fish do have really thin skin you, I, i've noticed that yeah they're i've i've skinned a fish it's like paper you know? <laughs> i don't give a shit i'll feed into it what the hell <laughs> yeah all right all right uh, i'm actually that mean hearted I, I really am you have to understand that <laughs> yeah 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 all right let's uh let's go into the the next question like you you hear sometimes about people saying, well, if you do these exercises, you uh, you can increase your testosterone levels, or if you do this, you can you it decreases the testosterone level. So, like when we're talking about these normal fluctuations that you see in in hormone levels that do happen during mm-hmm. during the day and during if you do different exercises, do they really have any effect on muscle growth? You you really here's the rub on that, and you're you're. You're very closely infringing on something I was bemoaning before we actually started this off camera about the natural crowd kind of haranguing me about you know, my views on insulin. 
So to say hormone levels have no effect would be wrong on many levels and would also violate things I've said in regards to other hormones. Here's the thing. Like everything, it is really about a long-term average. On average, it's your long-term average hormone levels that determine any Thing. Your your femaleness, your fatness, your leanness, any real topic is not about the momentary value of a thing, but the long-term average of a thing. Now, momentary, av- momentary fluctuations can affect momentary in performance. For instance, spiking, such a stupid fucking word, but spiking your insulin in a certain window can affect its action right then. Spiking your growth hormone can have an effect right then. But to really see a protracted, sustainable change in body composition from that, you have to stretch it out and see that over days, weeks, months, potentially even years. Okay, This is an example I use to illustrate that point, and it's a little childlike, but I think it's one that everybody can kind of follow along with. Let's say you had a bottle of Dianabol. I know, horrible, terrible, awful, illegal, awful demon tablets but let's say you did okay and you take the lid off there's a hundred tablets in there let's perform an experiment in our minds an experiment two people one person is going to take the whole bottle all at once they're just going to just ah, like the silly you know tv show you know it's like oh i'm addicted to steroids he just ah, and he just you know just chokes down a hundred tablets the other guy is going to take one tablet a day for a hundred days Who's going to accrue more muscle mass? The guy that's taking it every day. Exactly. By a lot. As a matter of fact, the guy taking them all at once will accrue approximately no additional muscle mass because he's going to get one signal and one signal only. You know, it's going to be, oh, my God, grow muscle for eight hours and then no more. There's no more signal. Whereas the guy that's taking them every day is going to get a consistent signaling every single day. Build a little more muscle, build a little more muscle, build more. And over the course of a hundred days, that little signaling is going to manifest just like a little bit of interest in your bank account. You don't notice it each day, but at the end of the year, you might be able to buy yourself something nice. That's the scenario here. So to say hormone levels don't matter is wrong and childish, but to really obsess about a momentary value is also wrong and childish. This is a long-term process. And again, going back to childhood, it takes 10 years to turn you into a child from a child into an adult. Yet people think that spiking their testosterone from some goofy, you know, root powder or you know, beetroot or whatever the fuck they're taking, you know, sarsaparilla or whatever goofy thing, herb, they think that one dosing suddenly just going to turn them into a superhero. And it's just silly. I mean, even among steroid users, which I'm very intimate with, there's no one dose of anything that matters. You know, it's still, you know, week-long, month-long, year-long cycles of drugs to make people look like drug users. This idea that your momentary hormone levels really amount to squat is kind of silly. And and to be fair, and, and I don't mean to be overly condescending to you and your listeners, but if you think about it, you should be able to work this out. This is, I sh- you shouldn't have to come to me for verification on something that shamefully obvious. You, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it, it, again, like the, a perfect example, a perfect corollary is everyone wants to demonize insulin. Insulin's making people fat. It's the obesity epidemic. It's the twin demons of sugar and insulin. And it's fucking cousin corn syrup. Think about this. Does anybody get obese in a day or a week or a month? No, it's a fucking career. These lazy asses sit around and work at it day in and day out, overeating and being inactive for weeks and months and years and fucking decades, and that's how they get obese. It's a project. Nobody gets obese in one day from, oh, shit, insulin snuck up on me to sleep. Now I'm fucking fat. Like, really? God damn. Have a, see, that's the problem. Is I'm gonna have a fucking stroke on on you know on national TV talking about you know, and then the headlight's gonna read you know crazy steroid carbohydrate fanatic dies while you know yelling at natural people. You know. Just, <laughs> yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. But 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 I I I I totally agree with, with what you were saying because people usually like like for 
it, it, it's a good point that you're raising because people that gain a lot of weight and get obese, when they start to want to lose weight, they expect that to happen really quickly. Right. And you have to explain yeah. to them that, well, it took you four years to gain all this weight. You can't expect to lose everything in just four weeks or whatever they're, they're saying. Like, these changes take time. Yeah, if it took you four years to get fat, it might take you four years to get lean. Yeah. That's a re very realistic concept when you look at how nature kind of moves. You know, it's interesting. The seasons all seem to be about the same length. Like, shit seems to be kind of, you know, counterbalanced and equilibrium-like. And, you know, again, pay attention in junior high school, folks. <laughs> what else to say? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, so yeah. Anyway, divert me. Give me a question that I don't have to yell about. <laughs> Yeah, let's uh, let's go into. Uh, I know this is a questions that a lot of people ask. Um, blood work, like when, like there's a lot of guys. Typically, I'm not saying just guys, but a lot of guys often ask this question. Uh, I want to go to the doctor. I want to get blood work. I want to check how my levels are. But mm -hmm. like with with all things, when you do blood work, you can't just look always at one variable and, and based on that say how the status is so what type of markers should you look at mm -hmm. if you want to get a, a total understanding on how your hormone levels are okay um i'm gonna add a layer that you didn't ask for and probably isn't completely relevant to your audience but i want to put it out there the the first thing to understand is largely I deal with people that are using drugs. That's largely why they come to me, why I'm having the interaction. So with that in mind, the first thing I look at and the first thing I coach them to make super sure they have is what in, in American parlance would be the CBC, the blood values, hemoglobin, hematocrit, the volume and substance of your blood mm -hmm. because – Having high liver enzymes, having high or low estrogen, having high or low testosterone, there's no way that stuff's going to kill you today. Might kill you in the future, won't kill you today. Having inappropriate blood viscosity can lead to a stroke and death today. So in the order of severity, that's where I start because that can proximally lead to mortality. So that's where I look first. You know, having high liver enzymes, no matter how high they are, if you're still alive, you're good. We can go, oh, you got to settle down. It'll, you know, it's going to take some time, but you're going to be okay. Your, your hemoglobin gets above 18. You can literally die on your way to the hospital. So it's that kind of thing. Now, for most naturals, not, that is not a concern, but I do like to point out that that's my mindset is I put things in order of physical mortality based priority. Okay, I think that's an ethical way to do business. You know, performance is useless if you die. <laughs> Again, sounds incredibly childlike, but somebody has to say that out loud. You know, dying really kicks the shit out from under your sports performance. So let's tackle that first. So the first thing I look at is CBC blood values. Usually, if there is a problem, the solution is as simple as you should probably run off and donate some blood. Get that out of the way. Get those values down. Give yourself some more margin. Boom, that's done. The next thing I would look at on blood work is renal and liver health markers. You know, liver enzymes, ALT, SLT, you know, uh, bilirubin. And e by the way, even for naturals, that's very important shit. Your training and your lifestyle and even your actual health infections, underlying things can affect those values. So those are really, really important to everyone especially if you're, you know, drinking alcohol or using steroids or anything. I have met more than a couple times I've consulted with naturals. Don't ask me why they come to me, but they do, who have actually brought me, you know, blood work where they've had very, very poor liver values. And in one case, it turned out a person had hepatitis, didn't know it. Really a big deal. In another case, um, a person was actually getting uh, heavy metal poisoning from a vector that was unbeknownst to them. They were actually getting it from work, and it turned into a big schmoz. But nonetheless, my point is is that it's not the sole domain of drug users. You know, health problems exist out in the world at large. They're everywhere. It's really easy to find. So that's how I would go: is you know, blood values, liver and renal. Again, uh, you know, kidney values, uh, creatinine. Uh, CPK, creatine phosphokinase. I think maybe you guys just call it CK, creatine yeah. kinase. 
you know, creatine phosphokinase is what we would call it. Same thing. Um, that basically shows uh, cell damage markers. Again, and also that's one of the reasons why you might not want to trust this. I hate to speak negatively of the medical profession because I don't mean it that way, but it might be a reason. This is a great example. CPK specifically might be a great example to seek out someone like myself or p- perhaps even you over your family doctor because doctors are not trained to look at athletes. Athletics at large will skew those values into a range that a doctor might interpret as problematic. Your doctor sees a creatine kinase, you know, up in the, you know, up elevated and they're going to be like, oh my God, you're, you have kidney disease. You need a transplant, you know. And the reality is it was actually, you know, deadless. So, you, you do need a certain context to consider that. Okay, so get that stuff out of the way. Now I would look at hormones. The first thing is make sure you're not going to die. I think that's very important. Now, once we get to that, now we're looking at sex hormones at large. And the reality is this list can be as long as your arm. If you have unlimited funds, there are unlimited ways we could spend them on tests. If you were, you know, constrained by both, you know, finances and maybe the, you know, amenities available to you, I would start with testosterone, estrogen. Ideally, I would get those in a more complete panel than just the basics. I would get testosterone both bound and unbound. We'll explain what that means. I would also get binding globulins, sex hormone binding globulins. And then in estrogen, estrogen comes in a number of iterations, talking about that crude oil thing where it breaks down. Estrogen, in common parlance, we're talking about E2. But the reality is that E2 breaks down into a ton of metabolites. All of them are relevant at some point in the conversation. Some of them affect libido. Some of them affect the joints. Some of them affect just cardiovascular stuff. Some of them, we don't know what the fuck they do, but they're still in there. So knowing that, you know, knowing that they're there can be very valuable. If you have unlimited funds, you could look at things like prolactin, progesterone, corticosteroids, cortisone, you know, cortisol. You don't need that information, but it's valuable if you have the ability to get it. Okay. Then even moving further down into the obscure and unnecessary, it's never a bad idea to check your plasma insulin levels, A1C associated with that as well. Uh, Never a bad idea to look at your growth hormone and IGF-1 levels. Not imperative, but again, never a bad idea. So it's one of those situations where you can always dream up another way to spend your money. But if you had basically just CBC, metabolic, which is you know, kidney and liver, and then basic sex hormones, you would have the fundamental understanding of what your body should be doing in terms of what direction your lean mass should be going, what direction your performance should be going. And again, you can get creative. You, it would never be a bad idea to look at... Um, uh, thyroid, both T4, T3, reverse T3, uh, T3 antibodies, thyroid antibodies. There's a ton, again, it's, it, it, there's an unlimited amount of money you can spend if you want to. And what I would suggest is stick to the fundamentals, like I said, CBC, metabolic, sex hormones, and then dial in on one of those other groups if you feel you have a concern. If your leanness isn't the way you think it ought to be based on the time and effort you've spent, Maybe we dial in on the thyroid stuff. If, you know, there's, you, you suddenly there's been changes, maybe in your skin texture, hair texture, that sort of thing. Maybe we'll look at the growth hormone stuff. You know, it's kind of a common sense, which is dangerous. I understand. But in general, like I said, if you look at the fundamentals, you will have the fundamentals. Then look under different rugs based on your suspicions. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And I think it's a good point that you raised with, I'm not saying that you shouldn't trust your medical, like even my dad, oh. is, even my dad is a doctor, but I, like, I think you, you made a good point because they don't usually work with, with athletes and then they don't always have the understanding on how both diet and training can affect a lot of these markers. You know, going back to my uh, my ability to speak by analogy, I was actually present. Somebody actually presented this to me. A, a, a friend of uh, a, a family member, kind of lost and distant, removed, but nonetheless, a family member of mine was a very excellent auto mechanic. He was actually renowned. Like people would come from towns away to get him to work on their car. And uh, I was kind of coming into the, you know, adulthood, and I asked him straight face, and I, I really thought he was the guy I needed for this information. I said. I finally got a good job. I, you know, I've got some money. I'm going to buy a new car. What should I buy? 
And he looked at me and he says, never ask an automobile mechanic what the good kind of car is. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, we don't see good cars. We only see cars that break. He said, I could tell you the shitty kind because I work on them every day. He says, I don't know what the good ones are. They never come to me. And it, it clicked in my mind and I realized that's exactly the position of all professionals. Doctors have no idea what health looks like. They never see it. They only see sick people. Only sick people go to doctors. So doctors only see sick people. I'm not criticizing. I'm just pointing out it's their job. Their job is to deal with sick people. My job is to deal with athletes. It sounds silly, but it's really poignant and really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, Yeah. And uh, it's a... It's a it's a great point. Um, going back to the thing with with the blood work. Let's say if you want, yeah. if you if you're, for example, concerned about, let's say you're a natural guy, concerned about mm -hmm. having low uh, T levels. Is it is, is okay. it sufficient to just measure uh, testosterone, or should you measure a few other things as well? Well, there, there's a whole bunch of things I'll caution you on there. First of all. One measurement is useless. In science, one measurement is never valuable. You can measure you know, how tall a tree is, but without measuring other trees of the same species, it tells you nothing about the health of this tree. Is it dwarfy? Is it giant? Is it you, you just don't know. You need a body of measurements to recognize a trend or something aberrant. So that's the first thing is I counsel people, natural or otherwise, get blood work regularly from day one that way we can tell what normal is and then we can see deviations from normal if your testosterone is 10 percent higher or lower than historic norms that tells us something but just to get a measurement go i have 400 nanograms per deciliter well we know in the bell curve of humanity that's a little low but to you that might be just perfectly normal so again my, my point is here is I'm, I'm not criticizing getting blood work. I'm just saying that one measurement isn't particularly relevant to shit. So with that concept, the same concept can be dialed down. Measuring one thing is a little out of context and not very relevant. So I would not recommend you just measure your testosterone value. I would always suggest you measure the complement of associated things. Testosterone, estrogen, and binding proteins minimum. Because one... You could have high or low testosterone simply because it is or isn't converting to estrogen. So if you combine your testosterone and estrogen value, it might be the same as ever. But for some reason, your fatness, number of other things, more of it might be diverted off into the testosterone or the estrogen pathway. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a low testosterone problem. It's in some way a priority problem. Typically, that problem is brought on by body fat levels, but nonetheless, it's my point is, you know, measuring one thing doesn't really tell you the picture of what's going on. You need a, 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 an overview, and then, even then, I have to ca caution you, and I, I'm not trying to make you sound self-defeating, but even then, the picture's never big enough. Like, I can look at your testosterone, your estrogen, your binding proteins, and not realize that you have a thyroid tumor that's affecting your thyroid values that's skewing these so it's it's never enough you know you can always dial out and look at something a little bigger but again finances and practicality if you have to know that at least measure that you know whatever that is start there and then again if you have the ability or extra concerns dial out and look at bigger pictures because bigger picture is always valuable awesome yeah yeah, my point was that you see a lot of people, they will go to the doctor, they'll tell the doctor, can you measure my testosterone? And it's really not telling the whole story when you're just not doing one Absolutely. measurement. Uh, Absolutely. Luckily here in Norway, it's not that in the States, I know, but luckily here in Norway, you pay like eight bucks or something to take to do blood work. So it's it's pretty, pretty cheap in Norway uh, anyways. But uh, how often would you recommend people take? Like I'm not talking about people on performance enhancing drugs, I'm just talking about in general, how often would you say people should take, do blood work? Really, interestingly, or perhaps it isn't interesting to you, but it is interesting to me, um, I don't differentiate. Mm -hmm. I think 
that there is a reasonable and relevant time frame at which to expect the ability for change. Biology moves at a given pace. Even if you're performance enhanced or you're not, it still moves at a given pace. Like I said, with those hormone levels, the moment to moment just doesn't matter much. It adds up on weeks and months. And my experience is the most proximal you can expect to change is every three months. Less than three months, you're just measuring chance. About every three months is far enough apart that you could actually see a change. Okay, So three months is about the maximum frequency every three months and then my my you know for people that are constrained by money or geography or you know access to professionals basically my attitude is the minimum you should get is twice a year i really think that's the minimum to even say you're doing it so um that that's basically and to be honest i don't really prioritize you know drug users ahead of non-drug users events whatever what i prioritize is the the severity of missing mm-hmm. the the consequence for not getting the measurement is far more grave but the need for it still exists in both demographics like i said about you know like cbc values getting blood work every three months is important it's more important to a drug user simply because if those cbc values crept up you're a little closer to death but it's still that's the time frame in which you would expect to see a change so the number doesn't actually change it's just the imperative and paramount momentarily to you awesome great next question is um we talked a bit about um estrogen and how people say well Mm -hmm. estrogen is for females and testosterone is for males so is there any uh like let's let's talk a bit about the effect of estrogen on males both the positive things and the negative things um sure the, and the negatives pretty much are all based on a threshold value. There is no negative up until you kind of think of it as just a big bell curve. And there's no negative on the way up the hill. It's only until you round the hill. In a, a, This is a little childlike, but it's it's valid with concessions. More is better until more becomes too much. It, that, it, more estrogen typically means more libido, better joints, better cardiovascular system, better. Everything's better up until you start to manifest female characteristics. At the moment when you start to grow breast tissue, that's not better. But in general, people kind of I, I get this all the time. Tell me a value that I should peg my estrogen at. And my answer is always the most you can have without getting titties. And they don't like that answer. But that's the answer. Some people, that problem exists way down around, you know, 100 nanograms per deciliter, uh, 50 nanograms per deciliter. There are people like myself that can go all the way up to 200 and not have problems. Yes, I'm lucky. Yes, it's, it's, it's uncommon. But it's, the fact is, if I kept myself at 50, I would be doing a disservice. And if the guy at 50 tried to be where I'm at, he would have titties. So it's, you know, there is a science to this, and it is, you know, all science-y, but at the same time, there is individual differentiation, and we are not all the same. And we don't tolerate things the same. So it's just, you know, what it is. Now, again, because I keep my estrogen so high, I also have the libido of a fucking porn star, and... You know, so it, it, there's, there's, it's, oh, no, that sounds like a great thing. Everybody's like, woo! Yeah, yeah, for sure. Try that, try that for two weeks on end. And see. <laughs> it's not out of the house. You, you, you just, you know, sitting on a porch in the rain, like, I promise, I just want to come inside, like, you know. <laughs> Maybe I'm giving away too much, but <laughs> anyway, anyway, it's, it's a real thing. So, like I said, nothing's a free ride. And unfortunately, I can't just spout out a value. You know, I don't have a big Pope-like hat. I can't just pontificate and go, thou shalt have an estrogen value of X, and you will be big and strong. Like, it it just doesn't work that way. I can tell you the system, and the system is allow it to creep up, if you can, to the highest possible value before you manifest, you know, female sexual characteristics. Back off a little bit, and that is momentarily your sweet spot. That's, you know, that's how I do that where I, you know, in a 
theoretical world where I was managing someone's drug use, that's how I would do it. I would look at their blood work, and I would consistently want that value to raise until I'm thinking they're on the cusp of female sexual characteristics, and then I would pull it back a little, and that would be my target zone. And keep in mind, that's not forever. Changes in behavior, you know, activity, you know, changes in diet, changes in body fat, changes, changes, changes could change that value. That's what changes mean. This is a very dynamic system we have here. Um, the enzyme is something we didn't, we kind of alluded to, but I don't think we said it out loud. The enzyme responsible for cleaving testosterone into the subhormone estrogen, that enzyme is manufactured in fat tissue. So very roughly you could say the fatter you are, the higher the potential you have to convert testosterone to estrogen. And conversely, the leaner you are, the less potential you have to convert testosterone to estrogen. So right out of the gate, your leanness can have strong impacts on what's going on. Excellent. So, and by the way, I, I'll throw out a little extra layer of biology cleverness. That simple act is a wonderful example of nature's diagnostic abilities. One of the major impetus of any creature is reproduction. But reproduction needs some sort of governor. Avant-garde reproduction is very bad for species survival. Making babies when there's no food, for instance, or when the climate is wrong, or when predators are about, or there's a lot of things that might tell biology. Now's not the time. Conversely, there are some signals from nature that might say now is definitely the time. As body fat levels creep up, the enzyme to produce estrogen, which controls libido, goes up, meaning nature saying there's lots of food out here, i.e. you're getting fat, maybe it's time to make another hit, mouth to feed. Mm-hmm. You see that's people, you know, people focus on the what does it mean to me and they kind of forget that it means something to the bigger picture, the dynamics of life. And once you start to understand those dynamics, it can help you understand a little bit more why your body does this when you do that or why it should do this when you do that and that sort of thing. So I just I just thought I'd throw that in there because personally I find that sort of thing fascinating that nature can derive the state of food supply from something as simple as you know that and then it can determine that you know now's a good time to ovulate now's a good time to you'll know, make babies and all and so on because of you know an outside piece of information as simple as being putting food in your mouth so i find that sort of thing fascinating and it, it never never steals my it never stops stealing my attention away yeah wow that's really interesting and i'm glad you I'm glad you brought it up and, and shared it with, uh, <laughs> with my listeners. All right, Broderick, I think that's uh, enough for part one of our uh, podcast on hormones. And I think we'll continue the second part the next time. So thanks a lot for taking the time today to do this podcast. And I'm looking forward to do the second part with you uh, shortly. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, we'll, we'll see if you can tolerate another iteration, another volume of me. But um, I'm, I'm happy to be come back and finish anything you like. I'm sure I can. So no worries about that. All right, Broderick. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.